I'd like to welcome you all to this seminar that we have planned today. And I want to start with acknowledging the traditional owners of the country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. So I'd love to welcome with great pleasure our guest speakers, Associate Professor Paul Griffin and Associate Professor Nada Hamad, and all of you joining us today. We'd like to take a moment to acknowledge everyone who's been impacted by this COVID-19 pandemic today and over the last 18 months. These are very challenging times and I want you to know that the Leukemia Foundation stands with you. September is Blood Cancer Awareness Month and more people are being diagnosed with and losing their lives to blood cancer in Australia and around the world every year. We know that people with a blood cancer have the best chance of surviving and living well when they're diagnosed quickly and treated with the best medicines. Blood cancer is Australia's second most diagnosed cancer but it's not on our radar in the same way as breast cancer, melanoma, or even prostate cancer. So please help us spread the message through sharing some really important information about blood cancer with your family, with your friends, and with everyone you know. And you can visit our website for more information. So let's get cracking and hear from the experts. Associate Professor Paul Griffin is Director of the Infectious Diseases at Mater Health Services in Brisbane. Paul is the Principal Investigator and Medical Director at Nucleus Network. And this is a specialised contract research organisation specialising in early and late phase trials in infectious diseases. He has been the primary Principal Investigator in excess of 125 clinical trials, predominantly in infectious disease, including novel vaccines. And this includes six vaccines for COVID-19. So if this guy doesn't know it, nobody does. As a clinical microbiologist, he maintains an active interest in diagnostic microbiology with a focus on clinical applications of fecal microbiome metagenic sequencing. Finally, as a board member and scientific advisory board member of the Immunisation Coalition, Paul has an active interest in vaccine education and advocacy. He is a trusted media authority and a spokesperson across the nation during COVID-19 pandemic. And while performing vital clinical and research duties, Associate Professor Griffin has also devoted time to inform, educate and reassure the community via a wide range of media appearances. We are so grateful to have you here today and we thank you for you giving out your, us your time and your expertise to this. Thank you, I'll hand to you. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. Sorry, it was a bit long. Hopefully everyone can see my slides now. Um, some of these slides are a little bit content heavy, but uh, I'll focus on the key points. So um, you don't have to, to read the whole slide and I suspect they'll be available for you later on. You can go back and look at that, some of that additional content if it's of interest. So, um, I do have a few relevant conflicts of interest. None of these have uh, shaped the content of my talk, but I am involved in quite a few COVID studies and do some advisory board work to relating to a number of the vaccines and therapies for COVID. Um, here's a quick uh, overview, but I'll get straight into it. Um, you heard a little bit about this. I mean, at the moment, I think there's about 5 million uh, experts in Australia, if you believe, Facebook. Um, on infectious diseases and vaccines at the moment. But uh, I guess the, the reason I do get asked to talk a little bit about vaccines um, is that I'm not only, as you've heard, uh, an infectious diseases physician, so I, I do uh, treat COVID patients and I do have a role in being the director of where I work in terms of infection control, um, but I have been involved in a lot of the clinical trials for COVID vaccines, So, uh, and also the uh, Immunisation Coalition that you heard a little bit about uh, have an active role in, in advocacy and education around vaccines. So that's uh, part of the reason, I guess, why 
I do get asked to talk about a, a few things. So I probably don't need to go through this in any great detail, but I guess the gravity of the situation is, is fairly clear. And if you look at the cartoon on the right, at the moment, COVID-19 is eighth in terms of uh, the world's biggest pandemics and obviously on track to keep climbing up that list. But uh, hopefully we can do something about that with our vaccines. Uh, cases in Australia are over 63,000 and over 1,000 deaths. So no question we've had relatively good control, but we may not be able to keep that up forever. So here's a, a list of the specific approved therapies that we have access to. So realistically, we're still very light on in terms of therapeutic options, which I guess just highlights why prevention is so important. We do have a great uh, monoclonal antibody therapy that's uh, now available in Australia. Um, and, and this is one that uh, we can give to people at very high risk of progression based on their background risk factors early on in their infection. So we now do have something, I guess, to modify the course, but we don't have a specific antiviral yet. Lots of those are coming through, but uh, until we do, and even when we do, vaccination has to be the key. I thought I'd just quickly touch on uh, the mechanisms to compare because there's a, a lot of misinformation around some of these. So obviously what we wanna do with any vaccine is expose their immune system to something on the surface of the virus. And in this case, it's the spike protein. So that's the protein that uh, this virus uses to bind to our cells to gain entry. And so if we expose our immune system to, to that before, so we can generate an immune response, then we can be prepared when we do get exposed to the virus. And so there's all sorts of different ways of exposing our immune system to those spike proteins. With a viral vector, what we do is we basically carry the instructions for our cells to make those spike proteins uh, in a harmless virus. And uh, with uh, AstraZeneca, the most uh, prevalent of, of vaccines of this mechanism, it's a modified chimpanzee adenovirus, so a benign virus. It's not like a, a live uh, vaccine like uh, measles, for example, that we do worry about giving in, in people that are potentially immunocompromised. It's uh, a viral vector, so not, not a, a truly live vaccine. Um, the, the commonest uh, uh, vaccines using that platform is Oxford AstraZeneca, Sputnik V, which gained a bit of notoriety from Russia, but we're obviously not using here, uh, as well as J&J, &J, which again is not something that is on the cards to be used in, in this country, at least anyway. In, in terms of the, the protein-based vaccines, well, these are perhaps the, uh, the simplest way to, to make a, a vaccine. We basically just make those spike proteins in the laboratory, but uh, often we don't quite get a strong enough immune response if we do that alone. So we add in some kind of other technology. And usually what that looks like is we, uh, we add an adjuvant, which is something that helps to boost that response. But we also try and assemble those spike proteins into something that looks a bit like the, the virus. With the case of uh, the most popular of this, uh, strategy that the Novavax, they make them into what they call uh, nanoparticles. And um, that doesn't mean there's microchips or other fancy things in there. It just means they make them into small particles that look a bit like the virus. And with the UQ vaccine that people might've heard about, we utilized a molecular clamp to keep it in the right shape. So as I say, Novavax is the, uh, the most uh, prevalent in terms of this mechanism uh, and is nearing um, approval, I would suspect, in a number of countries. And this is one of the ones we have a pre-purchasing agreement for in this country. So it will be part of our strategy, but will perhaps still be some months away. In terms of the inactivated or attenuated uh, vaccines, this is where we do something basically to, to stop the virus being able to reproduce or cause harm and basically give the whole virus um, the common strategy here is to inactivate the gene so it can't replicate. And while this seems like a, an obvious, easy strategy, and there's lots of these vaccines in use in uh, other countries, th these have been a little bit underwhelming when we compare to the other mechanisms that we're talking about and that we're going to utilise in this country. So I won't go through that in any more detail. The nucleic acid vaccines... Um, are really important because obviously that's the, the vaccines that we're, I guess, uh, in addition to AstraZeneca using the most. And in this case, what we do, so when I mentioned the viral vector, we use a harmless virus to carry in those instructions. In this case, we inject those instructions directly in the form of mRNA, and that makes uh, our body make the proteins, those spike proteins, and then we get a really good immune response to that. So it does have some um, interesting points. Uh, in that um, it is a, a little bit unstable in that it doesn't like to hang around. So we do need to coat it with something and it's a, a lipid or oily layer. And that's what people can have an allergy to. So that's why you might hear about an anaphylaxis risk with these vaccines, but it also needs to be kept really cold because at room temperature it degrades or, or gets chewed up really quickly. And so that's why we talked a lot about the, some of the logistical challenges of needing that extreme cold chain or those really super powerful freezers to be able to store and transport this around. And you know, these vaccines are working really well. 
Um, they do have some side effects and I'll touch on those uh, later on, but on balance are very safe and highly effective vaccine. I just put this slide up to show that uh, mRNA is not new. I think nobody had really heard of it or it wasn't very commonly discussed. But if, if you look at the two companies that have made the, the two vaccines we're using most, so BioNTech are the people that made the Pfizer vaccine and they partnered with Pfizer to, I guess, scale it up. They've been around for... Uh, 13 or 14 years. They've got lots of other candidate vaccines. And Moderna, again, has been around for around 11 or 12 years. They've got 24 other vaccine candidates. And I, the, the paper on the top right there was some work I did with them on their RSV candidate back in 2016, 2017. So it's actually not new and it's been under investigation for a long time. So people say we don't have long-term data. Well, we, we tried that RSV vaccine uh, four or five years ago. And so the, the most common vaccines using this technology is, of course, that the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, both, uh, both safe and very effective. And I'll just show, again, not to go into the primary data too much, and you don't have to be a statistician to see, <coughs> excuse me, the, the flat line at the bottom, these are cumulative incidents of cases. The flat line at the bottom is people that were vaccinated. The line that keeps climbing are people that received the placebo. So really clearly effective. That's for Pfizer. And, and Moderna generated a very similar graph. People who received the placebo had a uh, steady increase in cases, whereas people that received the vaccine had next to no cases. So highly effective. And people like to compare the two of them. <clears throat> Realistically, they're very similar. Some really subtle differences and a, and a very busy slide. But the main thing I'll draw your attention to is both had really large clinical trials, both almost the same in terms of efficacy. And we, we argue about 95 versus 94.5, but basically there are other trials that show that's the other way around, but either way, it's both very high. Um, some slight differences in terms of side effects, <clears throat> but realistically almost identical in terms of how those vaccines work. And again, a lot of people like to make lots of comparisons. Um, in the end, all of these vaccines that we're going to use, Oxford or AstraZeneca, and even Novavax when it comes online, are very similar in terms of how they work. And particularly, the, the main thing these vaccines do and do so well is to provide nearly 100% protection from severe disease. So while people will argue about transmission and, and that you can still have uh, so-called breakthrough cases, those people that are vaccinated are protected to a very high degree from severe disease, which in itself is an amazing property. And a lot of people like to argue about Pfizer being better than AstraZeneca. And again, a, a fairly deliberately busy slide, which basically can be summarised with this. So no. So uh, early on, there was a lot of discussion about some limitations of AstraZeneca's clinical trials and some low efficacy rates. But AstraZeneca, I guess, discussed their results in a slightly different fashion, that they had lots of small trials. And actually, when you look at it now in the real world experience, and that's the, the good thing now is we had clinical trials, the clinical trials were really big, but we now have tens of millions of cases of real world experience that are being analysed. And for every study that showed Pfizer was better, there are some that show in, in other ways AstraZeneca can be better. So again, both highly efficacious vaccines. And again, unfortunately, no medical intervention is free of side effects. But uh, what we do is we look at the the risks versus the benefits. And basically, if we're not very confident the benefits far outweigh the risks, we don't even do the clinical trials, let alone approve therapies like this. And so in terms of the adverse events, they're talked about a lot at the moment, but actually still relatively rare. It's not uncommon, of course, for people to get uh, local pain, so a bit of a sore arm the, the day or maybe the, the following morning after your vaccine. And fatigue and headache are the most commonly reported systemic effects. But we, the, typically rate those as mild, which means they, they would rarely interfere with your day-to-day -day activities. And then the next most common uh, systemic adverse effects are things like fevers and chills, usually on the night of or the, the morning following your vaccination. Interestingly, these uh, appear to be slightly higher with your first dose of AstraZeneca and higher with your second dose of Pfizer. So for all those people that uh, went around saying how great their first dose of Pfizer was, usually it catches up with them on their second dose. So realistically, the incidence of these sort of effects is very similar between the two. And we do have some important, serious, but very rare adverse events with both of these vaccines. And again, just to say, these are incredibly rare. So I think in this country, particularly, they're overrepresented in terms of our discussion. And so people have a perception that they're common, but that's definitely not the case. And in fact, if you look at the incidence of those sort of effects, they're really quite similar across the, the two vaccines. So with the mRNA vaccines, we have that allergy risk, anaphylaxis. But in this country, while we're seeing that quite commonly, all of them have been managed well and, uh, and have not um, led to any negative outcomes. And the thing that's talked about a bit more is this inflammation of the heart muscles, so myocarditis, pericarditis. And in Australia, until uh, 
uh, just over a month ago, we had 111 cases of this. But again, this is typically mild, self-limiting, so it gets better. And of course, the thing we've talked about the most with the AstraZeneca vaccine is this thrombosis, thrombocytopenia syndrome, or it gets called VITS or, or uh, VTT and all sorts of other things. So in terms of the numbers, 57 confirmed cases from 6.8 million doses. That's from a few weeks ago. So again, it's still a very rare event, even though almost every one of these makes the front page of the papers. And just to quickly go through that in a bit more detail, again, some of these are uh, a little bit uh, content heavy, but the, the key thing here is it's not typical clotting. So we get a lot of people that say that my uh, great auntie's next door neighbor had a DVT, so I think I, I don't wanna get this vaccine, but it's a very unique mechanism. So it's not like a, a typical clot. Um, and, and it seems to be driven by the immune system. So it's immunologically mediated and a little bit similar to when people can have a, a bit of a reaction to a, a blood thinning medicine, heparin, uh, in that the antibodies basically activate those platelets. So it's not like those typical clotting syndromes that people might get from being on a plane or after having an operation, for example. Um, we suspect this, we've got a, a fairly finite time window. It's typically in that sort of four to 28 days after the vaccine. So it's not that headache you might have the next morning. Most of them happen within the first 14 days. And again, the, the site of clotting typically is in a, you know, in a pretty bad area. Um, so it's not like those, those typical clotting syndromes we see. And then there are some blood tests we can use to help. <clears throat> I've put the treatment in there just really to point out that since we've understood a bit more about it, we're much better at recognising it. We now have some really effective therapy, so we can alter the course of this and for most people help them recover relatively quickly. And here I've just outlined in a bit more detail. Early on, we talked about fairly high mortality figures. Again, a lot of that was driven by the fact we didn't really understand it. We probably did some things that were in some ways the opposite of what we've now been set, been shown to, to work really well. So we have great ways of recognising, great ways of managing it. So most people will recover fully. And again, a, a deliberately busy slide. We have to weigh up the pros and cons. And with this vaccine, there are so many positives to weigh up. So it's really effective, as I said. Um, and we know that these vaccines not only help with that severe disease, they do reduce the incidence of symptomatic infection. They do help with uh, reducing getting the infection and passing it on. The AstraZeneca vaccine we can make in Australia, it's got some, some very significant logistical benefits over some of the other vaccines in that it doesn't require those extreme cold chains. So there's a lot of positives about that vaccine. And then if we weigh up the negatives, the TTS incidence does remain uh, very rare. And aside from that, it does have a really good side effect profile. So it is going to be a vaccine that we're going to continue to use as part of our strategy moving forward. And again, just some things for context. We, we do see quite a high number of those more typical clotting syndromes. And so that will mean some people, unfortunately, will, may get one of these, <coughs> excuse me, after they get that vaccine. And it's likely just to be a coincidence. Again, if we vaccinate a big proportion of our population, we see a fairly high incidence of this in the background. We're going to continue to see those same background rates and a lot of those won't be related. A lot of this too, I think there's a, a lot of biases. So um, we're talking so much about these cases that I think it's given people a perception that it's relatively common. And, and if we look at some, some things for perspective there, a general anaesthetic carries with it a risk of death of one in 57,000, which is far less, of course, than this. And the annual road toll is over 1,000, but most of those unfortunate people that uh, don't survive those car accidents don't make it into the mainstream media. Whereas uh, as of a few weeks ago, we'd had 57 confirmed cases of TTS, but I think it's given people a perception that's a very common event just because of how much it's talked about. And uh, I mean, some of these are a little bit uh, tongue in cheek, but I just thought I'd put some, some comparisons with some other mortality figures there. Swimming and running and jogging have a mortality of, uh, of one in a million. Cycling has a mortality of one in 140,000. So if people are gonna be riding their bikes home today, they're putting themselves at greater risk potentially than the AstraZeneca vaccine. And then when I was looking at good comparisons for mortality, there was this study that showed if you were uh, V, it increases your, your risk of inflammatory related deaths. So if people are going to binge watch something on Netflix, they may be doing more harm than the AstraZeneca vaccine. So again, some of that's obviously uh, a little bit of a joke, but uh, it is important to point out that uh, we need some context here. <clears throat> in terms of our situation in Australia, there's been a lot of criticism, of course, that we've had some supply issues, but that's really been out of our hands. We, we've got a huge supply agreements for these vaccines, 170 million doses, basically. So Pfizer is now up to 40, AstraZeneca 53.8, with 50 million of those being made on shore. Novavax, we've got an agreement for 51 million doses, but that'll probably still not come till next year. And Moderna, 10 million this year, 15 million next year. 
So if you look at it, we're actually in a really good position uh, aside from some of the supply constraints that, as I say, are a bit out of our hands. And I won't go through this data all that much, but obviously we're really well behind where we should be, but making some inroads, I guess, in recent weeks and months um, based on the evolving situation, particularly in those Southern states. Um, just want to quickly touch on the, the Doherty modeling, because this is being talked about uh, a lot uh, in, the, in the mainstream media in, in recent times. And we have to keep in mind that modeling is just that. Um, it's our best prediction at uh, any point in time based on plugging in a number of variables into, into a sophisticated computer system. But we're in control of our, our trajectory and we can alter that by changing what we're doing. And so, for example, if we add in more mitigation strategies, so more people socially distance, get tested, and of course, more people get vaccinated, we can improve on some of these, um, these predictions. This is a, a lot of words, but you'll see what it says um, in the little light green section at the top. When we get to 70% or thereabouts, we'll transition to the vaccination transition phase, and 80% will, will put us into a consolidation phase where things become a lot more specific and reasonable and sensible in terms of our mitigation strategies. And they don't need to be as broad and harsh as locking down entire states and keeping borders closed. So that'll mean things will become a, a lot easier. And again, this is um, the important points about those 70 and 80%. And this is something that's hotly debated. So when we talk about getting to 70%, um, it's impossible for us to promise we won't ever have to lock down but the modeling would very strongly support the fact that lockdowns basically should not be required at 70% coverage. And at 80%, that goes even lower. And of course, something uh, unexpected could happen, a new variant, for example. Um, but outside of that sort of a unpredicted uh, eventuality, at 80% vaccine coverage, we should be able to control things with very simple mitigation strategies alone. And so, so that's why that's our target and why we really need to get there to be able to move forward. And this is a, another part of that modeling that doesn't quite get talked about um, so much, which just basically says that uh, we really need two doses to get uh, enough protection from Delta. And AstraZeneca is highly effective. You can see yeah, in these studies, it's almost the same numbers uh, as Pfizer. And we have lots of that vaccine. And so we clearly need to use it in people that are eligible for that vaccine. We're still working on lots of new vaccines though. Um, and, and that's not to say our current vaccines aren't fantastic. And as the little cartoon on the right says, the best vaccine is the one that you can get right now. But we've still got some properties of these vaccines that I think we can improve upon in time. It'd be great to have a single dose vaccine, maybe one that lasts a bit longer, maybe one that's better at blocking transmission. And so that's really a goal that we're looking at quite a bit. Um, one that's a bit easier to store and transport, a bit cheaper or easier to make, for example. So there's lots of work ongoing in making new vaccines. And so this is the vaccine tracker. There are 99 vaccines currently in clinical trials. You can see these numbers add up to more than that because there are vaccines that are still in phase one that have actually gone all the way through to, to being approved or abandoned. So that's why, as I said, it doesn't add up to 99, but yeah, there are 99 vaccines that have entered clinical trials, which is uh, simply amazing uh, accomplishment to have done in such a short space of time. So there's a lot of work on being able to try to develop a vaccine that we're given uh, through the skin, which of course would be uh, a lot easier than having to use a needle and syringe. So most of these are actually DNA based and they actually need some other kind of fancy equipment to basically uh, get that in, whether it's uh, a little bit of electricity or a bit of pressure. Um, and so that'll be really exciting. And there are also little uh, patches with micro projections that can be coded in vaccines. So one day we might have a vaccine that can be applied to the skin. Um, and there's lots of work on intranasal vaccines. And so this will probably not replace intramuscular vaccines, a traditional needle and syringe like uh, a lot of us have had. But the thought is if we give the vaccine via the same route that the virus gets in, so through the respiratory tract, then we can hopefully generate some uh, protection that might be better at reducing the chance of getting infection. Um, and so there's lots of uh, vaccines in studies um, using this sort of technology. And I'm doing one here with a vaccine called Tetherex, where we basically spray a little bit of the vaccine into the nose. And I suspect in the future, at some stage, we might combine this with an intramuscular vaccine to help reduce the prospect of getting infection even further, which will be really exciting. And, and even oral vaccines, and this has always been a big challenge because our, our digestive tracts are designed to basically destroy stuff and, and not mount an immune response to it. Otherwise, we get a lot more food allergies than people already may have. But just as an example, that the one down the bottom, I'll go into that in a little bit of detail in a moment because that's one that I'm working on and that's pretty exciting. 
And so the vaccines trialled in, uh, in, in Australia, uh, or the ones that I've been involved in, so we had the University of Queensland vaccine, which did look very promising and attracted a lot of attention. I think there's a lot of patriotism around a, a local candidate, but unfortunately that one didn't work out. We had a slight issue with uh, what was termed diagnostic interference with HIV testing, but there are some new vaccines underway using a, a different uh, technology there. So there may still be one from the University of Queensland in the future. And one of the properties we'd like to improve on is the uh, ability for new variants to maybe reduce protection. And so with this vaccine from uh, the Serum Institute of India that I'm helping them with, instead of being the whole spike protein, they're just targeting the receptor binding domain. So the, the little bit of the spike protein that binds. And so the thought is there that that's one that doesn't change quite so much. And so might be a bit less uh, susceptible to being uh, reduced in terms of protection from variants. So we'll see how that goes. And as I mentioned, we're trialing an oral vaccine, which is really clever. So with the viral vectored vaccines that we inject that I mentioned earlier, we inject those uh, instructions or they're carried uh, in a harmless virus. In this case, those same instructions have been put in a, a bacteria we call a bifidobacterium. So basically that's a, a probiotic. So instead of drinking Uvalia for gut health, we've put the spike protein instructions in a bifidobacterium. And so they express that, uh, that proteins in the gut and hopefully generate an immune response. And so we'll see how that one goes. It's early days yet. And as I mentioned, this is uh, one of the intranasal vaccines we're trialing. And um, one of the trouble with intranasal vaccines is you typically need some way of, uh, of boosting it up because you don't tend to get a high enough response. And so they've done some clever things in terms of how this works so that we get basically a hundred times um, the spike protein we'd see for the AstraZeneca vaccine, for example. And so hopefully that's enough to get a good response when we spray this in people's noses. And we're doing that in healthy volunteers here in Brisbane at the moment. And so, there's been a lot of really good work specifically on, on haematology patients. And of course, we have an expert who's going to touch on this in a bit more detail to come. But I guess just from an infectious diseases and, and vaccine person's view. So, I mean, we, we hear about risk factors for COVID and it's a bit of a contentious topic in terms of how that's discussed. Basically, any medical problem or even age is a risk factor for progression to more severe disease with COVID. But, but clearly, um, haematological issues are included in that. And of course, if people's immune systems aren't working um, quite like we'd like them to, or they're on some medicine to turn that down, there may be some challenges with terms of how the vaccines work, but that's not to say they're gonna be completely ineffective. There's still likely to be at least some protection. This is why we potentially have to focus on um, the people around them. And this sort of strategy gets called all sorts of things, but I guess it just makes sense that if uh, someone's at a slightly lower chance of responding to the vaccine, if we get all of their household contacts, all the people around them vaccinated, and this I guess includes staff at the places where these people need to go to, to get medical care, then we can go a very long way to protecting them. But I guess we also need to reinforce the other mitigation strategies, which you know, in themselves, and this is things like masks, hand hygiene, social distancing, and of course, getting tested. No one of those things is completely, perfectly protective. But when you combine that into a suite of mitigation strategies, of course, it goes a very long way to protecting people. But um, in terms of adverse effects, we typically say that uh, this population doesn't have an increased risk of adverse uh, events and the standard contraindications apply. And again, don't expect people to know those abbreviations, but these are sort of things that'll get asked um, wherever you go to get your vaccine. So heparin-induced uh, thrombocytopenia, so that, that rare reaction to heparin, which has a similar mechanism, uh, similar, very significant clotting issues in the past, so not those standard clots like DVT and PE, and specific allergies to components. All of those things will be asked about. If people do have one of those actual very limited contraindications, well, we've got other vaccines that are available, but basically the summary there is that, uh, you know, these vaccines are basically recommended for everyone. Just some quick uh, frequently asked questions, and I'm sure some of these things will come back up in the chat. Um, a lot of people talk about the fact these vaccines don't completely stop transmission. And, and this has come from a few, I think, mostly misunderstandings. <clears throat> At the start of the year, we couldn't say how much these vaccines block transmission, because this is something that's really hard to measure in our clinical trials. But now we do have some really good indications of this from the real world experience and, and doing some clever things like looking at household transmission studies and, and larger epidemiological studies, which shows that there's probably about a 50% chance on average um, reduction in terms of people getting uh, the infection and about a 50% reduction in transmission from those people that are infected. So of course, we'd like that to be 100%. It really is with most vaccines. So that means some people that are vaccinated can still, of course, get the infection and they can pass it on, much less likely to do so 
and much, much less likely to get really sick. So um, really important points. And a lot of people are talking about breakthrough infection. And I think that comes from a recognized paradox. Whereas if you have 100% of people vaccinated, well, then all your cases are going to occur in vaccinated people. But the thing is, that's still a, a lot less cases than you would have seen. And a good analogy there is about seatbelts. And so if we look at our car crashes, most car crashes occur in people wearing seatbelts. That doesn't mean that seatbelts cause car crashes or they don't work. It's just that everybody wears them. And it means the consequences of those car crashes are obviously far less in terms of significant injuries. And so that same sort of paradox, because a lot of people are vaccinated holds true, but again, their vaccines are still working tremendously well. In terms of boosting, I'm sure we'll come back to this. Um, some countries are already boosting at, at eight months, and most of us think that's not the best idea. I think we all agree though that these vaccines aren't gonna provide protection that lasts lifelong. So boosters will be required but we haven't yet worked out the ideal interval. Personally, I think it's going to be every year. Any less than that, I think isn't going to be feasible or necessary. And there's this concept of um, what we would call heterologous boosting, which means switching the vaccines from the one people had first. And again, I think that's what our strategy might look moving into the future. So if you've had uh, an mRNA vaccine first, well, maybe your booster next year or when it's required might be a protein vaccine like Novavax, for example. So we might switch people around. But again, we're doing a lot of work to work out exactly what the best strategy will be. So we'll be well prepared in time. Variants of concern, I'm getting near my time, I think, so I won't go over this in any great detail. But the main thing to say there is that this is what we expect with a virus, particularly in a pandemic like this, where there's so many cases. And one of the real benefits, a real strength of our response has been this um, sequencing that we're doing. So we're mapping the evolution of this virus in real time. All things change. We see changes in human cells. And unfortunately, when, when that happens unchecked and it's not corrected, and unfortunately, human cells are pretty good often at fixing those random errors. We see things like cancers, unfortunately. With viruses, they don't have ways of correcting those errors largely. So we see a lot of mutations happen. A lot of the time, it just makes the virus um, less well. So it just kind of disappears. But occasionally, just by random chance, it can give it some properties that give it an advantage. And so, for example, with Delta, it's more infectious. And so that one that's just arisen through random variation has kind of taken over. So we will keep seeing new variants emerge. At this stage, there are none for which our vaccines don't provide fantastic protection. That might come into the future, but we can fix that fairly quickly with changing our vaccines to accommodate that. And so when we talk about all those challenges in terms of response and um, mutations and new strains, really our biggest challenge still is uptake. We have fantastically effective, very safe vaccines, but unfortunately, if they remain in fridges and not in people's arms, we're going to have a very high percentage of our population who are susceptible and going to continue to, to suffer the effects of this pandemic. We, we're not going to eradicate it, but our vaccines work fantastically well. And, and the way I like to describe it is I think we need to learn to coexist with this, with this virus in a way that controls the risk, controls the impact, so that we can continue some basic mitigation strategies that have uh, minimal impact themselves on our day-to-day -day lives. And I think we can definitely do that with the vaccines that we have, but only if, of course, enough people take them. So I think I'm getting close to my time. So yeah, basically we, we've got some great vaccines. Um, they're well studied, well proven, highly safe, highly effective. Um, there are some adverse effects, but they're very rare, um, manageable, and uh, um, we don't see very often. We've developed a number of good vaccines here and had a big role in a lot of the clinical trials. We're going to have a lot of uh, good so-called second generation vaccines coming through. And I think it's up to everyone to, to spread the right information so that we can get as many people vaccinated as possible. And uh, I'll leave it there. Paul, thank you so much for donating your expertise and time for us today. That was an absolutely fascinating walk through the science. Um, I'd like to move now to introducing and welcoming Associate Professor Nanda Hamad. Associate Professor Hamad is a senior staff specialist, bone marrow transplant and cellular therapies and clinical and laboratory haematologist at St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney. Uh, she is also director of the Haematology Clinical Trials Unit. She has two postgraduate degrees and fellowships specialising in bone marrow transplant and lymphoma from the Princess Margaret Cancer Centre in Toronto, Canada, 
through the University of Toronto. She has a strong interest in clinical trials and drug development and has a specialist certificate in clinical research from the University of Melbourne. Her research focus is in haematological malignancy, incorporating novel agencies and diagnostics and bone marrow transplantation and cellular therapies. She has been a principal investigator on over 30 studies and has a number of high profile publications. She is an international and national leader in the field of haematological malignancy, bone marrow transplants and cellular therapies. She has developed strong international and national collaborative research works and networks within bone marrow transplant research. Dr. Hamad is president of the Australia and New Zealand Transplant and Cellular Therapies, chair of the Australasian Bone Marrow Transplant Recipient Registry, chair of the Agency for Clinical Innovation in New South Wales Bone Marrow Transplant Network, and chair of the Australasian Leukemia and Lymphoma Group, and Cellular Therapies Working Group, and Scientific Advisory Committee member. I think we can agree she is an extraordinarily talented and busy lady. She will be supporting uh, the study of the Australasian Leukemia and Lymphoma Group and promoting it nationally and internationally through her networks. She has developed formal research agreements with Cellular Therapies and Transplant Canada and the UK Impact Group. She is also a member of the international uh, NIH GVHD Consortium and the World Health Organization Bone Marrow Transplant Group. She has developed Australasian management and vaccination guidelines for haematological malignancies during this COVID pandemic. And we are very grateful that she's agreed to share her expertise with us today. Thank you, Nada. Thank you so much, Jenny. That was uh, much longer than anticipated in that introduction. <laughs> so apologies for that. You don't you need to hear all of that. Um, I just wanted to share my screen with you now. So hopefully this is um, working, but we'll just try again. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming to this extraordinary meeting. I think it's one that I've really wanted to share with everyone for a very long time. So thank you to the Leukemia Foundation for making it happen. A lot of hematology patients have been asking these questions, you know, worldwide, Australia-wide. And I think it's really a good opportunity for us as clinicians with infectious diseases, expertise, as you've heard from Paul already, and uh, from a hematologist to, to get it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. So today I just wanted to talk specifically about hematology patients or patients with blood cancers. I know I've seen already a lot of questions in the chat and these questions I'm getting are ones that I hear every single day. To start off with, I just wanna acknowledge the fact that we're all experiencing COVID fatigue. It's really uh, done a number on us from a variety, for a variety of reasons and I don't need to go into them all, but particularly for hematology patients or patients with blood cancers, the fear is actually quite a big issue. There's a concern around the vulnerability of patients with blood cancers um, with COVID and what that means for them. Um, it's, you know, COVID has certainly disrupted our routine medical care, so access to hematologists may not be as frequent. And the fact that we're doing a lot of things by telehealth can be quite challenging for some. There are obviously economic impacts, social impacts, you know, COVID has really unmasked a lot of social and gender and racial disparities in our community that actually do have an impact on health outcomes as well. And the immune compromised patient is specifically vulnerable. Um, you know, we are noticing that really our patients are vulnerable to the goodwill of others to get vaccinated. So it's something we'll touch upon in a moment, but that vulnerability brings its own stressors. So from, from the hematology community, I just wanna say, as clinicians, we hear you, we see you, we think about you all the time, and we advocate for you at every chance and every time we get a chance to do so. And Paul has just 
talked about the risks of COVID, particularly for hematology patients. I'm not going to dwell on this too much for a very practical reason. For some of you who may know me, I'm a very pragmatic and practical person. It's all about trying to get solutions and advice that is possible to follow. Viral pneumonia causes disproportionately severe disease in patients with blood cancers. This applies to COVID as well as other viruses. So we've already experienced this in hematology before COVID, that we know that our patients are more vulnerable to viruses than the average patient or the average person on the street. In terms of COVID, the data sets are very small. The numbers are small. So every time a study is published about CLL patients, about myeloma patients, you name the hematological disease or blood cancer, there will be some data on this, but the numbers are really small. And it's very difficult to establish what is the true risk because the, there is a diversity of geogra geographic locations. So for example, you know, data from the US may be different to data from New Zealand because New Zealand doesn't have much COVID. So when we look at the data coming through, it's usually based on the country where COVID has emerged and it's not all the same. In general, we've seen that patients with CLL, multiple myeloma, lymphoma, and other blood cancers, in generally most blood cancers who are on therapy, have a higher risk of death from COVID. So some of these numbers that are put up there are averages or estimates. So at best, the data that we have estimates your risk. And that estimate is roughly around a third for most patients. And I think that is something just to take away, that you have a higher risk of dying if you have a blood cancer from COVID if, compared to if you don't. Patients who have had bone marrow transplants, whether they're allogeneic or autologous or also increased risk and roughly in the same proportions. So the number to take away is a third of patients who get COVID if you have a blood cancer potentially at a risk of dying. So what are we doing about this? From a, from a medical point of view, all we can do is protect patients as much as we can. So we're moving patients away from the hospitals. We're asking patients to avoid contact with others who could potentially give them the, 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 the infection. So we're doing things by telehealth. We're mitigating exposure in hospitals as much as possible. So we're not bringing people in if we don't need to bring them in. And we're trying to reduce immune suppression wherever we can. We're trying to avoid reducing the, the therapy that we were going to offer anyway, that's going to be life-saving or curative, but we're trying to minimize immune suppression if we can. We are vaccinating staff, we're vaccinating patients, and we're encouraging patients to get people who live with them to get vaccinated so there's that additional benefit of, of protection around the patient. I put up this position paper to firstly demonstrate the number of hematologists across the country who came together to develop this position statement. You may see your own hematologist in that list. And if you do say hello to them and thank them for their time, because this was a labor of love. It took quite a long time for all of us to get together and come up with these consensus statements about how we wanted to manage patients with lymphoma, CLL, myeloma during the pandemic. I also wanted to put it up because you can access this through the internet. It's, you know, it's on paper. You can read it. It's actually quite easy to read and you can probably get some information for your own personal context from that paper. And you could discuss that with your clinician should you feel the need to. So the vaccines. Paul has gone through this extensively. None of these vaccines are live vaccines. So in terms of safety, I'm more than happy to recommend all the vaccines to my patients. None of the studies actually included patients with active cancers, so it's very hard to discuss the impact of the vaccine in terms of safety or efficacy, despite the fact that we believe they're very safe, specifically in cancer patients. I cannot pull out data magically from somewhere to say it's been tested in cancer patients. That just hasn't actually happened. But we can make a lot of inferences as we do for all of the vaccines. You know, most vaccines haven't been tested in cancer patients, but they have been tested in a really, really large population. And that population gives us the signals for safety. And with those um, large studies, I'm quite satisfied that it's safe to deliver. All of the vaccines show marked um, uh, reduction in severe disease in healthy patients, so over 90%. And that's healthy patients. You know, we can argue about the minor differences in numbers, but 
really that practically doesn't matter. What matters is we're trying to keep people away from hospital, being intubated, the, 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 the problem and the pain and suffering that comes with being hospitalized and intubated and being severely unwell. Now, how that applies to cancer patients, I'll talk about in a second. Now, the efficacy is problematic because blood cancer patients, by definition, have a cancer that impacts their immune system. Blood is where your immunity comes from. So if you have a blood cancer that affects your ability to create antibodies to either a virus or a vaccine, then you're inherently not going to be able to respond effectively to the vaccine. And we've seen this in other viruses. So this is not the first time we've found that patients with blood cancers don't respond effectively to vaccination. We've seen this in patients who have received bone marrow transplantation, which is why we have bone marrow transplantation vaccine schedules and strategies around that. The other thing to remember is that blood cancer patients have treatments that can also reduce the efficacy over time. So if you're in a long you know, course of therapy, that might reduce your ability to pr produce antibodies or even to maintain them if you did produce them in the first place. So we can't really appreciate for each individual patient their likelihood of responding to the vaccine. All of my patients are different. All of the, 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 the pandemic has occurred at a different time point for each patient's journey. So I can't specifically say for each individual patient um, what the number is or the likelihood that they're going to respond are. So from a practical point of view, I say, look, we're going to vaccinate you, but you've got to act like you're unvaccinated because I don't know if you've responded appropriately or not, or whether your immunity is going to be maintained or not. The question about can we check this with a test is quite a fraught question. We may be able to check it with a test, but most of the tests that we would use to check this response have not been validated. So there is usually an antibody that we can detect to the vaccine but we're not quite sure what level of antibody actually means immunity. And are we confident that the immunity that we check tomorrow is gonna to be maintained in someone with a blood cancer? So do we keep checking every day to check it's maintained or not? If it's zero, well, what do we do about it? If you haven't achieved a response, well, what does that mean? Will you be more immune if we give you more of the vaccine? And the answer is we don't know. So I'm a big believer in not doing a test if you're not gonna act on it. And unless there is an action attached to that test, then my recommendation is we don't check. Now that can create a bit of anxiety either way. Not checking can make people anxious because they don't know, but checking and finding out that you don't have a response also will make you anxious. And so, you know, for all of the tests that we do, we usually have to think very hard about the utility of the test, and the validity of the results that we get. In terms of studies that can help us figure out this issue, there are a number of studies internationally looking at vaccination and immune compromised patients, particularly cancer patients, including blood cancers. We have a study in Australia that's currently ongoing and there are a number of studies that are looking to set up. And the study at the moment, the Zero Oz study is funded by Cancer Australia and the Leukemia Foundation. And we're looking to recruit patients who are not vaccinated, vaccinate them, test their responses, and look at ways we can boost their responses with further vaccines down the track. It's a very good question as to what is the best strategy to do that. And I think there needs to be clinical trials to identify that. We don't actually know. And the reason why this is challenging is because not all blood cancers are one conglomerate disease. Each person, potentially, if you drop all the different types of diseases and the different medications and the treatments that are on and the timelines in their treatment journey, you will find that we're starting to look at smaller and smaller groups of patients. So getting answers is harder and harder, the smaller the number of patients. And blood cancers in general are rarer anyway. So it's something we have to collaborate on nationally and internationally to answer. Um, 
In terms of vaccine complications, I won't dwell on this too much because Cole has already talked about this, but in general, complications are no higher in hematology patients, at least in my experience, most of my patients are vaccinated. I haven't noticed that any of them are sicker or getting more local reactions with sore arms, headaches, muscle aches, et cetera. There are some precautions in patients who may have low platelet counts or patients who um, have bleeding disorders, and those issues are addressed in our vaccine guidelines as well. As Paul said, allergy is rare, and the rarer complications he's mentioned with myocarditis and TTS, or the thrombosis, or the blood clotting disorder with AstraZeneca, again, are very rare and manageable. Many patients ask me, when should we get vaccinated? In general, the consensus statement that we've put out um, from Australia and New Zealand is that we will aim to vaccinate patients if we can, as quickly as we can, with both doses prior to starting treatment for their blood cancer, if possible. We don't really want to delay life-saving treatment, um, so we wouldn't do that for the vaccination purpose on its own, but we would try and aim to get someone vaccinated beforehand if we can. Now, even after patients are receiving treatments or are on treatments, it all depends on where the, the, the country is in its, its transmission data. So if you were living in New Zealand, I would say, oh, there's not much COVID around. Perhaps we finish your course of treatment, depending on how long the course of treatment is, like if it's three months, six months, 12 months, that period of time of being unvaccinated versus the risk of getting COVID is what we balance. So we want to make sure that we don't miss an opportunity to vaccinate if there's an urgency to vaccinate. So in New South Wales at the moment, I'm encouraging my patients to get vaccinated wherever they are in their treatment. In terms of when to vaccinate after treatment, we know that certain treatments reduce your capacity to create antibodies or to respond to the vaccine. And those are particularly around diseases for lymphoma, leukemia, most of the blood cancers, in fact. And those treatments in general, if they stop, we would normally wait a little while to see if your body is able to regenerate generate that capacity and then vaccinate so that we can get more bang for our buck with the vaccine. But if that is not possible or the risk of COVID is emerging and getting higher and higher, we may choose to do that earlier. So for example, in bone marrow transplantation, we normally vaccinate patients three months to six months after transplant so that, they are, so that patients are off immunosuppression, they're off treatment, and then they can actually try and you know, achieve a vaccine response to the vaccination schedules that we normally give. But in the context of COVID going rampant, we would try and make that earlier. We would bring that sooner. And that's reflected in the guidelines that we've written as well. Many patients ask about boosters. Again, boosters are emerging as a, a common theme. We, we normally have to repeat our influenza jab every year because of variances and you know, that come through the viruses or variants like we say in COVID. Um, so we're probably going to need boosters to try and, and manage these variants that are emerging. We also know that over time, immunity wanes. And so as immunity wanes, we probably need boosters. But this data is coming through from the healthy, broader population and not necessarily in patients who are immune compromised. We don't know when the correct time is or the ideal time to repeat vaccines or to boost vaccination in patients who have got blood cancers, because we don't really know what their response was to begin with. And whether your initial response means that boosters are going to work for you or not, or when is the right time to boost. This is why clinical trials are going on, around, um, going on across the world to try and figure this out. And like I said, because blood cancers are so rare and there's such a variety of treatments at the moment, which is great for saving lives, but when it comes to trying to identify the best time, it is very challenging because there's such a diversity in patients and treatments. The questions we wanna know are when to vaccinate, how to vaccinate and with which vaccine. And again, this will take some time to establish. So the practical thing for, for patients in, these, in this position is to get vaccinated as recommended by GPs and hematologists, and then act as if you are not vaccinated. 
I'm going to put up the physician statements on vaccination guidance for hematology patients. Again, so you can see if your clinician's in that list and thank them. Um, this position paper is quite short. It's very easy to read and it specifically addresses what we would recommend. And it's a good talking point with your, your hematologist or your GP should you feel the need to discuss this issue for you personally. There's also one for bone marrow transplantation and cellular therapies to make sure that everybody has a specific guideline on this issue. And we have, again, a diversity of clinicians and you may see yours on that list. Please look this up online. If you Google physician statement, internet, internal medical journal, if you Google my name, you'll probably find this online. And I'm sure the Leukemia Foundation has had this up on their website on a number of occasions. I'd rather go to questions now because I'm sure there's lots of them. I can see the question numbers rising and I'll stop sharing now. Thank you very much for those presentations, Nada and Paul. Um, there is some common themes in the questions. So what I might do is just start asking and see if we can cover most of them. So um, one of the, there's quite a few questions about blood transfusions and whether there is any immunity in donated blood, if it's tested for COVID uh, immunity. So. Nada, Paul, I'm not sure who would like to answer that question. <laughs> I'm happy to answer that question. Um, blood transfusions or packed red cell transfusions are really not whole blood transfusions. We take away the red cells which have the capacity to carry oxygen and we transfuse those. The protein component or the plasma component of blood is usually removed. That is where immunity lies. And mm. in fact, we don't usually use plasma for blood transfusions. There is a potential of what we call convalescent plasma. So plasma from patients who have had COVID um, infection develop their own antibodies. The idea is that you could potentially minimize severe disease using convalescent plasma. There have been studies to look at this and there is some promising evidence in that space, but it's not something that is readily, readily available for treatment. Okay, thank you. Um, and the same um, question about immunoglobulin infusions and whether they have any effect if you've been vaccinated or not. So immunoglobulin infusions are again, a combination of antibodies that are selected out from a group of normal healthy adults. It's not immunoglobulin infusion, they're not from one person, they're from multiple people. And they don't specifically select for people who have been exposed to COVID or vaccinated for COVID. It's just immunoglobulin from anyone who comes through the door and manufactured into um, a product for delivery. Immunoglobulin infusions are designed to protect you from bacterial infections rather than viral infections. There is the added benefit that sometimes you can get antibodies in that product that fight off certain viruses, but there is no guarantee that that would be effective. There is no reason that immunoglobulin would minimize your risk, um, would, would minimize your uh, response to uh, vaccination uh, or impact your response um, to the, the, the disease itself, if you did get infected, um, I, I would probably put that in the basket of it doesn't really make a difference, other than to say, if you had a viral pneumonia, most blood cancer patients are at higher risk of developing bacterial pneumonias. And if you have low levels anyway, and your hematologist has prescribed immunoglobulin, it will reduce your risk of additional bacterial infections over the viral infection itself. Thank you. And last one, I guess, in that basket, um, there's a few questions about, and it is common, I know, in quite a few hematology patients have had their spleens removed for various reasons. And how would that affect you were you to be vaccinated? So um, vaccination is really important in patients who have had their spleens removed or have underactive spleens. We, we always advocate for vaccination of specific um, bacterial infections that generally the spleen has responsibility or a role in. And these are called encapsulated organisms. So they're usually organisms that are bacteria, not viruses, particularly pneumococcus um, and meningitis. So these are the vaccinations most people without a spleen would be aware of. 
Now, if you have a disease that reduces your ability to make antibodies, and this is why you're splenectomized or had your spleen removed, that's a very different story to a disease where you had to have your spleen removed that is not going to impact your ability to make antibodies. For example, immune thrombocytopenia is something that sometimes people will need a spleen removed for versus patients who have had a lymphoma in their spleen and had to inadvertently get it removed or had to get it removed for you know, medical reasons. Now, if you have a lymphoma and no spleen, chances are you're not going to respond to the vaccine because a lot of the lymphoma patients are not responding to the vaccine. But if you have ITP or immune thrombocytopenia, had your spleen removed, you are probably going to get a response. We would highly recommend vaccination in all of these patients because they are somewhat immune compromised anyway. Um, there's no reason to take that risk. And in terms of safety for both those conditions or those scenarios, it would be safe. Thank you. Um, booster shots. Booster shots are a, a really big topic. Um, I know that the FDA has just approved them in the US and Europe and the UK are starting to do them. What would be the outlook here? I know you both touched on them, but what would do you, what do you think would happen here specifically for booster shots? I think we need to get everyone to have had their first doses first. Um, we're a long way behind a lot of those countries that are considering boosters in terms of our, our rollout for a, for a host of reasons. And, and then the, I guess there's also the, the issue around the, you know, global equity and, and getting the vaccine to other countries as well. So I think we all agree boosters will be a, a very significant part of our strategy here. The optimum interval is still being worked out and it may well be that people whose immune response is likely to be less get prioritised with boosters at a, a shorter interval than say people who don't have those issues. But, but I think we're uh, a little ways off doing that yet. I personally think it'll be something that uh, is a bit similar to the flu vaccine campaign in that it will probably happen annually. I think once a year for many logistical reasons will, will probably be when we, we look at doing boosters. But there's a lot of good work happening in this space, so we'll be driven by a bit more evidence as we accumulate more. Thank you, Paul. Um, the other uh, theme, I guess, uh, coming up in the questions is there's been a few changes in the interval between first and second doses um, since vaccination started here in Australia. Can you explain why that's happened? I, I, I missed part of that question. I'm not sure if it's my side or your side. It might be my uh, dodgy internet in the university here. Um, I think it was about changes in the vaccine uh, timing of the doses timing? in yeah, between yeah. yep in between doses so why has that happened yeah. So, you know, a lot of what we've done is obviously based on, you know, really good evidence, but also that, you know, risks and benefits and consideration of the situation. And also we've seen the situation with the virus evolve. So we're really fortunate in this country to have a great expert group, ATAGI, that people have probably heard discussed a lot. And, and that group is tasked with reviewing the, the data, not only from clinical trials, but also the ongoing use of vaccines all around the world and including in Australia. And some of the big changes we saw were certainly around the, the Delta strain or variant, um, and some, some really good recommendations there that you really need two doses to get enough protection from that. So in areas particularly with uh, a lot of Delta circulating, we've brought forward the second dose. And so consequence there is it's probably slightly reduced protection overall, but we're boosting that protection quicker so that people are protected against Delta. So what, what we know is that there is a bit of flexibility with these intervals and uh, it'll be continued to be driven by um, data and the emerging situation at the time. So simple advice there is to have faith in our regulator and, and follow the local advice that applies at, at any point in time. That's great, thank you. Um, and then I guess sort of part of that theme as well is what would be, do you know anything about long-term side effects of the vaccine? So looking to the future, in, I know that we've only just started using them, so you have to take that into account, but is there any studies being done on long-term side effects? Oh, absolutely. And, and, and that's why I put that slide in there to, to show that both BioNTech, who um, developed the Pfizer vaccine and, and Moderna itself, have been around for a very long period of time, as has viral vector vaccine. 
quite excited about that, but they've been in use for, for a long period of time. And, and basically, we don't see long-term side effects of vaccines. That notion has come a, a lot from some of the misinformation around the measles vaccine, and it's linked to autism, which has been very firmly refuted. So yes, we've we've looked at this, and we, we simply don't expect there to be any long-term consequences of these vaccines, other, of course, than being protected from COVID and knowing that COVID infection itself carries very high rates of, of what's being called long COVID. So maybe uh, up to a quarter of people who get COVID might have symptoms that persist maybe upwards of a year. So the, the virus clearly has long-term effects, but the vaccines we really don't expect to. Thanks, Paul. Um, I actually just wanted to extend on that um, uh, question a little bit around um, what's the position statement around vaccination for someone who has already had the COVID infection? Yeah, good question. And, and it is something that's a little bit different depending on which part of the, the world you're in. We haven't really factored that into our recommendations too much in Australia because we've really had so few people that have had it that it's, it's not been a necessity. In some parts of the world, um, they've recommended one dose instead of two for people that have had COVID. Um, mm -hmm. because we know people that have had the infection get some protection, but that protection doesn't seem to last anywhere near as long as that that comes from the vaccine. I mean, that's what the vaccines are designed to do is to give you better protection even than natural infection. So as I say, some parts of the world that have had lots of COVID have, uh, have elected to give one vaccine in people that have had proven disease. But in this country, we're just giving people the, the same two doses uh, that they need. No, no increased risk and adverse events. Yeah. And, and those people obviously get uh, you know, extra protection from having the two doses. Great, thanks, Paul. And um, just in regards to clinical trials and if someone has had a vaccination, does that Im um, impact on their ability to participate in blood cancer-related clinical trials? I'll take thanks, that. Thanks, Nada. Yeah, there's a couple of studies. There's studies for vaccination-naive patients, that's patients who have never had the vaccine, and there's others for patients who have already been vaccinated to establish their response to the original vaccine and the, um, the utility of a booster in those patients. So when those studies come out, I'm sure the Leukemia Foundation will disseminate information and I'd really encourage as many patients as possible to participate because that participation will give us the answers we want. Um, you may be able to get your results of whether you responded or not, but for many studies that may not be available, but it's something that you can um, approach your clinicians in the various hematology centers that will be participating. Great, thanks Nada. And, and, and then extending on that in relation to broader blood cancer trials um, people living with blood cancer aren't excluded because they've they've you know had a vaccination or had infection no in so any way shape or form yeah most clinical trials um, on cancer treatments or blood cancer treatments specifically have made uh, concessions and uh, recommendations around covid vaccination around covid infection so it should not exclude you from a study if you've ever had COVID or if you've been vaccinated from COVID. In fact, it's usually encouraged that you're vaccinated irrespective of whether you've had an infection or not, just like Paul was saying. Great, thank you for that. Can I ask a question about if you've had any of the previously had any of the side effects associated with the vaccine? So if you've had clots or if you've had myocarditis previously, what would your advice be? So, uh, of course, the recommendation is to discuss with your uh, specialist involved or your vaccine provider to individually go through the pros and cons of different vaccines. I mean, with a lot of these things, if um, you know, there are contraindications for these vaccines, but they're very narrow and very limited. So, so most people that have had um, an unrelated medical condition, whichever vaccine their age group would recommend for them is likely to be the best one. But as I say, the, the main question there is to have a specific discussion with your, you know, whoever's looking after you or your vaccine provider. Um, typically, if people have had myocarditis or pericarditis before, we would probably recommend an alternate vaccine. And, and with relation to AstraZeneca, so if they've had that similar syndrome relating to heparin or, or one of the very significant clotting issues, so not a DVT or PE, but uh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, for example, 
then perhaps we'd recommend the alternative. I mean, in this country, we struggled for a little while to have easy access to alternatives, but of course we're getting more fires now, we're getting Moderna soon. So, so that ability to, to give people an alternate if they have one of those very limited true contraindications is, is getting better now. I mean, fundamentally, my, my comment around this is that we don't pe want people to feel afraid getting the vaccine, right? So make sure that you write down your questions, your concerns, and speak to someone about it. None of us want you to be frightened of the vaccine or frightened about what might happen to you if you do get it. And all of us want to make sure you're safe when you do proceed to vaccination. Um, and I don't think there would be any clinician who would dismiss your concerns. And if they do find someone who won't, um, you have access to hematologists, which is really quite uh, important in this in this question. And what what do you think will happen with children being vaccinated? There's a couple of questions about um, children who have blood cancers or have had blood cancers in the past who are under the age of 12. What would be your thoughts on that? So uh, a really important group to, to look at getting vaccinated, but not something we're recommending just yet. And not because we expect there to be any issues with the vaccine in children. It really just reflects the, the natural evolution of clinical trials. So, you know, as we heard that the early phase clinical trials start with a really narrow subset of the population, you know, really fit and well middle-aged people. And we gradually expand to be more inclusive. And you know, with these clinical trials, in fact, they were a lot more inclusive than we would typically see for vaccine clinical trials. We, we had a lot of elderly studies with these vaccines we had trials of people that did have some levels of immune suppression so so it's true it's not wasn't necessarily blood cancers but we had hiv subjects in a lot of these clinical trials for example but then what we do is once we've established the safety and efficacy in those groups then we start to look at uh, groups that are even a bit more uh, sensitive in terms of clinical trials and so that's pregnant women and children so all those trials are underway they're showing really good results and as we've done with every approval of these vaccines when we have all that data we'll then approve those vaccines even in those younger children and particularly with the mRNA vaccines, there's really good studies down to children six months of age that are showing a, a lot of uh, safety and efficacy in those groups too. So we will vaccinate children more and more into the future, but you know, we'll do so when we're very confident of the data when we get that data in. I'm going to have to go. So I just want to thank everybody for attending, all those lovely people who asked questions. Um, and I hope that uh, some of the resources we shared with you today and the talks we did share with you today are meaningful to you and helpful to you. Thank you so much, Nada, for your time and your wonderful insights. It's been um, greatly appreciated. You're most welcome. Bye. Thank you. While, while I know um, Nada certainly, and both Nada and Paul, you commented about the um, um, you know, sort of the uptake and efficacy um, of the vaccines for blood cancer um, consumers. There are certainly a lot of comments coming through the Q&A around, um, you know, the requirement for people to have testing after their vaccinations. Um, and Nada commented about, well, what do we then do with that information? Do we act on it or not? You know, Paul, are you able to maybe just talk to that a little bit more? Because it's a really, really common question that is um, that is circulating um, here and also um, in the community. Yeah, definitely. So um, the, the trouble is we don't really have great tests readily available to show that the, the vaccines have worked. In the clinical trials, we do all sorts of really fancy testing that's that's very specialised. And, and while a lot of people will talk about antibody levels, that really only tells a, a part of the story. The, the really good thing about these vaccines is they've all been very specific specifically designed to generate just the right kind of immune response that we need to get the best protection. And that includes a lot of activity from, from even things like T cells, some very specialised parts of the immune system. And so sometimes the antibody levels might be relatively low, but if we've got that response from those T cells, people are still really well protected. And so if we do antibody tests, it can be a bit misleading. Some of those have suggested that maybe 20% of healthy people that don't have immune system problems might not have detectable antibodies afterwards, but are actually very well protected. So it's likely what we'll do is, is use um, information we've gained from a lot of these studies to guide how we use boosters in, in that, as I say, people that have specific uh, issues with their immune system will likely be um, able to get boosters a bit sooner than the, yep. the, the healthy population. And the healthy population will also need boosters 
when we've got good studies to show exactly when that's required and and when immunity does go down, it goes down very slowly and very mm -hmm. slightly. And a lot of really good data coming out now that at six months, the immunity is probably reduced by, by less than 10%. So that means we've still got excellent protection even after six months. And that's why I think it'll probably be about once a year that we need boosters. And we may use boosters also to respond to the situation. So if we have a lot of really intense transmission in a, in a finite area, well, we might boost people in that area. So that we reduce the prospect for transmission and, and consequences. So, you know, our, our booster um, plan will be one that will have to be a little bit agile, I guess, a bit like our vaccination mm -hmm. plan has been, and, and we'll take into account a, a lot of factors, but be very data driven. Great. Thanks so much, Paul, for that. Yeah, it is certainly a, um, a very um, common and understandable question from the blood cancer community. Um, Paul, I'm not sure if you can answer this question. There is a few questions about revaccination. So transplant patients generally get revaccinated somewhere between six months to 12 months post-transplant. Um, but I think there's a few questions about the timing, not necessarily the timing of COVID vaccines, but other vaccines. So if you get your MMR again, when should you have that in comparison to the COVID vaccine? Yeah, look, again, a bit of an emerging space and probably a, a better question for the haematologists. Um, so, I mean, I, I would think that very similar to what we'd recommend with the other vaccines. Um, early on, we did want to space out the vaccines quite a bit. Uh, a lot of that was fairly arbitrary. So people might recall early on, we said it's going to be two weeks either side of other vaccines. But in fact, we've done some good work now to... to to show that that was in fact arbitrary and we don't need to and you can actually even give things like the flu vaccine and the COVID vaccine concurrently. A lot of it's about how you've you know responded to whatever that intervention was and where we your immune system is ready to go in terms of responding. I would think it is around that six month mark but you know a really good question for um for the haematologists as well. We've covered as much as we've perhaps going to cover in, in the time we, we do have available to us today. There have been an enormous amount of questions coming through. Um, we've tried our very best to cover the broad themes um, um, of, of those questions. Um, again, a, a really big thank you to Paul and to Nada. We really do encourage you to reach out to uh, your uh, treating teams and your GPs to have further conversation um, to help you make informed decisions about um, uh, your um, vaccinations. Um, we also encourage you to check our website um, for everything related to Blood Cancer Awareness Month and what's happening. Um, we have lots of uh, different events and, and messaging and information and resources um, for um, people living with blood cancer. So we encourage you to jump on the Leukemia Foundation website. Um, we will we'll farewell you for now and uh, look forward to connecting with you in one of our other events over the coming weeks. Thank you and um, take care and have a good day.